the Brexit talks are about to begin. But with more floods across the country and the coronavirus still spreading fast, the government suddenly has more pressing matters on its plate. We have some of the best public health experts in the world providing this sort of advice. As the death toll rises in Italy and Iran... He has posted a video of himself explaining that his test results have come back and it's positive. The British government braced itself for more coronavirus cases in the UK. Children returning from holidays in northern Italy are being sent home from school. Parts of Britain were again hit by severe flooding. It was a weekend of devastating floods. I've lost everything. Prince Charles paid a visit to those underwater, but not the Prime Minister. There are now even memes being produced, not asking, where's Wally, saying, where's Boris? Uh, Mr Speaker, I'm very proud of the response the government has mounted over the last uh, few days. What does he think about eugenics, teenage pregnancy, race, women and sex? Yet more controversy emanating from 10 Downing Street. We should prevent from racists from coming into number 10. Questions over a special government advisor led to a swift exit. Downing Street's refusal yesterday to condemn the remarks attracted searing criticism. Good afternoon. Meanwhile, former Chancellor Sajid Javid explained why he quit in a row over advisers. Advisers advise, ministers decide, and ministers decide on their advisers. Are you a workplace bully, Home Secretary? And this week, the Home Secretary was in the spotlight again. A breakdown in relations between Priti Patel and her civil servants. There was also a story that she's lost the trust of MI5. You think there's an element of misogyny in this? Yes, yes, I do. A report claiming rising health inequality made front page news. The people who paid the price were the poorest in our society. No, I know, and I know. So... This is more complex. And if you thought Brexit had gone away... There are three new potential flashpoints and one old one. The EU and UK each set out their negotiating positions on their future partnership. Tonight, I'll be speaking to the chair of the Defence Committee and former minister, Tobias Elwood. Ian Murray gets it, and that's why it's important to support him. And Ian Murray, Edinburgh MP, who's running to become deputy leader of the Labour Party. Evening all, we're live from Westminster. There's nothing more British than a cup of tea, even though the leaf comes from China via India. For some reason, Horrible Histories doesn't think we know that. And tea is pretty much a cross-party drink, spanning the political spectrum from Tony Benn to Margaret Thatcher. So you could be forgiven for thinking that a photo of the new Chancellor in front of a bag of Yorkshire tea, a bag as big as the fiscal deficit he's about to inherit, was hardly controversial. I mean, he's even a Yorkshire MP. But this is the age of permanently outraged keyboard warriors on social media. And the left-wing variety hurled abuse, anonymously, of course, at Yorkshire Tea, and some tried to mount a boycott. Just what the company had done wrong was never clarified. It's hard to know where this will stop. Here's a picture of the country's chief Brexiteer with a certain brand of sausage. Should Remainers now boycott heck bangers? I wouldn't rule it out. And look at this, a tribe of centrist defectors dining in a popular chicken restaurant. Should left and right now boycott Nando's. I'm sure some are considering it. It's not just food and drink. R.E.M. will soon be in trouble. President Trump uses the band's music at rallies. There goes its music sales among never-Trumpers. Yes, the silly season has come earlier this year, but don't lose your religion over it. Now, the government's launching a major foreign policy and defence review today. It says it's going to be one of the most radical since the end of the Cold War. I'm joined now by the chair of the Defence Select Committee, former Defence Minister Tobias Elwood. Good evening. Good evening. As this review gets underway, and it's going to be quite quick, it's going to be done by the summer, do the rising threats to the United Kingdom come from cyber or from the conventional forces of hostile states? You're absolutely right to pose that question, and that's the first thing that we need to ask ourselves, is to have a sober understanding of where the threats will be over the next 10 years. And I argue that over this next decade, life is going to get very uncomfortable, not just for us, but for our allies as well. And there's a fundamental question as to what Britain wants to play. What role do we seek 
on that international stage after being, I would say, absent for the last three years? Well, some are already saying that we're, that we're in conflict with Russia and China. It's happening now. They're actively trying to undermine the West, including the UK, with hybrid warfare, scripple, uh, electoral interference, cyber attacks, use of deniable mercenaries. It's called Little Green Man in Syria, Libya, Eastern Ukraine. Uh, don't we need, if that's the growing threat, to move resources from soldiers and tanks to cyber defense and offense. No, you need both. And this is why we need to advance the defense budget. And this is why we need an inquiry. We need a study of this, a review to make the case, to argue the case. I will argue now that our armed forces are overstretched. We cannot manage with a 2% budget. What you've just 2 talked... 2% of GDP. Two, two You're saying GDP. you cannot meet potential conventional force threats and the new 21st century threat of cyber with 2% of GDP. Our armed forces are overstretched. Our battle tank is 20 years old. We point to two new aircraft carriers, fantastic. But the fact that the naval defence budget didn't increase meant that the surface fleet has been affected. We have a fantastic F-35 and Typhoon. But in the Gulf War, we had 36 air squadrons. We're down to six today. Now, you touch on where the advancement of conflict, the character of conflict is going. It's moving into a new sphere, not just in cyber, but in space as well. If we wanted to protect Britain's interests, then we need to expand our capabilities, and that means making sure that we don't lose sight of those conventional capabilities, because we leave a gap there, and we could uh, find ourselves uh, vulnerable, but ultimately we need to cover those bases and invest more in the cyber and space arenas as well. So to meet the traditional threats and the new threats that you perceive, what percentage of our GDP should we be spending on defence? Well, you're asking me to make a calculation that we need to... This is exactly oh, why we need a, a review. Just give I'm me a ballpark. I'm saying by the end of uh, this parliament, then we need to go up to at least 3%. If we want to continue having that role on the international stage, that we actually thrive. Is there the political will to do that in this government? Well, my job is to make that case. But I'm afraid that there is a myth out there in the British public that we can actually do anything. We have the most professional armed forces in the world. There's no doubt about that. But they are absolutely overstretched. When there are problems in the Straits of Hormuz, we didn't have the ships to get there fast enough. When there are problems to deal with some of the offences that we're seeing with submarine warfare or uh, antagonism okay. by Russia, we can't right. cater for that. And then you touch on cyber and the space. Right. arenas to a rising China, a resurgent Russia. We've gone to a place now where we can no longer uh, uh, punish these countries, these huge rising countries. We have to go to a place of denial, stopping China grabbing further well, islands in the South China Sea. Well, because you, once yeah, they've got but, them, but we can do nothing on. about it. How could Britain, even with a navy twice the size we've got, stop China doing that? You're absolutely that, right. That's a problem for America. We can contribute only at the margins. It's not a problem for America. It's not a problem for Britain. It's a problem for all of us. But and America that... is the only country with the capability to uh, thwart Chinese expansion in the Eastern Asian Pacific Rim. And it's the Western interest to make sure that we have a collective effort. And I attended the Munich Security Conference only a few days ago. Oh, unlike and, the government. Uh, well, next time I hope I take a few more friends along. The point, though, is that their focus was the lack of the loss of sight of what the Western project is. What do we stand up for? What are the values that we defend? We have lost sight of that. And the absence of that, the vacuum that's been created, has allowed non-Western countries <laughs> rallying around China and Russia, which is fitting into China, to actually do what they want to do. But we see some reports, uh, the British Army, it's supposed to be 82,000 strong. That, even at that level, it would be the smallest since the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, there's now talking government of because they can't meet the 82,000, it's 8,000 shy because of recruitment, uh, that maybe they should settle for a smaller army. Should the army be downsized? Well, you're asking to then say, that's, I don't want to say the army should be this size. We should say, what do we want to do? And then the army then reflects the size of what we actually want to do. But you touch on recruitment, and retention, if we don't build the welfare packages, if we don't have the accommodation which attracts people, you particularly can't get people in, the, in full employment. We can't get join the first. because of but that. But look, Downing Street says it wants outside expertise to challenge traditional defence assumptions in this review. So here's a challenging thought. Why do we need an army, a navy and an air force? Are there not huge savings and efficiency to be made by combining them all under one unified command, 
like the Israeli Defense Force or the U.S. Marines? Well, the U.S. Marines sit separately as a maritime capability, and we have our own Marines that do exactly that. The Israeli forces are hold on, the U.S. Are Marines are not smaller. just a maritime capability. They have the capability to deploy in land, sea and air. They do. Just like the British forces. Why not bring them all under one single command? We would then surely get a bigger bang for our buck. Because the reason why the Marines, the US, don't operate in the full scale of that, they still have an army, an air force, a navy, and indeed a space command now, is because there's other activities that take place which aren't in the littoral or the maritime environment that you have to be concerned about. Yeah, but in terms of scale, the combined might of British military forces, in terms of numbers, is about the same size as the US Marine Corps. Uh, and the US Marine Corps is clearly the most effective fighting force in the world. I, I don't agree with that. You don't? Uh, they are extremely professional, but our Marines are as professional, oh, if not no, better than How many than Marines that. do we have? Sorry? How many Marines but do we have? But you're talking numbers, not per capability. Yeah, but you can't have 3,000 or 4,000 Royal Marines and say that they're a huge no, fighting force No, I'm talking about the training the and the equipment that they actually receive. They are, we are on a par, peer-to-peer, -peer with the US Marines. But we're moving away from the, the challenge here. No, no, I'm, is... well, I'm not actually, with respect. I'm trying to find ways of which Britain can even have a more effective military with more sensible spending. I mean, our forces are so top-heavy. Why does the British Army have 85 generals when the US Marine Corps, which is twice the size of the British Army, has only 80? Because, again, you need to understand what the Marines actually do. They're a fighting force which is operational focused. All right, you're then comparing that with what we've got in the UK, which is a lot of these, these generals and these positions are taking NATO responsibilities. They're elsewhere as well. So I'm afraid it's not Marine quite Corps apples has and NATO pears. NATO responsibilities as well. All right, if you don't accept that, why does the, the Royal Navy, which has only 19 warships, surface warships, why has it got 34 admirals? Again, because of the roles of the admirals, you have to look at the details of that. But let me, you know, oh, allow, no, me, hold on. allow me to, I'm rather talking, than go through a checklist of things, no, I will 19, agree. I'm not I, talking about captains yeah. uh, of ships. And by the way, we've got about 12 captains for every surface ship that we have. We've got 34 admirals because there's and a only myriad of roles. Ships. There's, a, there's a myriad of roles in the MOD and in NATO and in other alliances where we need higher ranking officials. I, let's go back to the 19 surface ships, though. I absolutely agree that that is inadequate. The Type 31 has been delayed. There's more problems in that. If we absolutely want to defend the new uh, post Brexit trading routes that we want to work with, and work with alliances and prevent non-Western states yeah. from grabbing territory and so forth, then we need to invest more you in our service fleet. You to me like one of the roadblocks is going to stop radical thinking in this defence review. What, because defend I don't agree with your admirals? I disagree defend, with that at all. Defending I want, uh, the existing structure. It isn't a numbers way, game with admirals wastes, or generals or field marshals. It, it's what the capability billions. is. British taxpayers' money is squandered in billions of pounds of procurement on top-heavy forces, and there are radical ways we could change it. But I mean, to be, to be as efficient and as well-equipped as either the Israeli Defence Force or the US Marine Corps would seem to me to be something worth investigating. I can just... I'm happy to look at that, and certainly as a committee chair, I'd be, be, uh, we'll do. I'm very familiar. I was in Israel only last week. I'm very familiar with their, force, they have a unified, their force structure. Unified demand, but it's, <coughs> they're demand. facing a very different kind of threat than, than we are, and their ambitions to play a role on the international stage is in, in a different line. There's uh, more comparison with the Marines, but like I said, why don't the United States States not have an Army, Air Force and Navy. They have those because there's other requirements that we expect our conventional forces to have. Right. I'm actually in agreement with you by saying well, the you equipment... me. <laughs> well, if you allow me to finish the sentence, I can explain. Our surface sheep, uh, fleet is inadequate for what we actually want mm. to do. We are, have too high spec ships uh, uh, for the, what we actually require. We need to look at having a more simplistic capability and having presence. That's All what right. we actually need to do. Let me uh, move on because there'll be plenty of time to come back to the defence review. You predicted that if the Conservative Party moved on to ERG territory, the territory of your most Eurosceptic Tory colleagues, that it couldn't win an election. You couldn't be more wrong, could you?
No, I don't disagree. I disagree with that completely. The, the, the phrase "one nation" came far more up than ERG by this prime minister, and the fact that we have this is not the soft Brexit. The, the you base wanted. of the party. Sorry, this is not the soft Brexit you wanted. It's much softer than the No Deal that I'm afraid that we are sliding towards. Where we are today is finally with a decision, and it's not for everybody's uh, outcome that they wanted, but it's something that actually works. We can now move forward with some form of, of determination to say this is where Britain can actually go. Sure, but you said the ERG, they're not my party. This is a battle for the soul of the Conservative Party. Steve Barclay, the chair of the ERG, he's just stood down because he says there's not a cigarette paper you can, between, you can put between the ERG and the government. I think you mean Steve Baker. Sorry, Steve, Steve uh, Baker, yes. Yeah, Barclay has got Steve a different Baker. job. He's actually I in government. I understand that. Steve Baker. Absolutely. And you don't he won, hear... you lost. No, no, no. You don't hear the voices of the ERG anymore. What you hear are the voices... No, because they're the voice of the government. No, they're the voices of the Conservative Party. That's Which what is we've the got. government. No, where our party is now moving you... forward to, with a majority of 80, as a one-nation ideology, is actually has an opportunity yeah. to reshape British Conservatism. But I understand that. But, but not in the views of the ERG. To, to, to Brexit. Where I challenge the ERG is that you had people standing up in the chamber not declaring that they were a member of the Conservative Party first, but they were a member of the ERG. And I that, understand. for many of us, was a concern. No, no, I see your quotes uh, uh, about it. But... You once and there was a concern you... that their mission, if I can finish the sentence, was to take us to no deal. That ah, has been prevented. Right. No, we are now having said... to have a workable relationship well, well, with the on. EU. You once said that you would try to block the UK leaving without a, a withdrawal agreement, was your position. If the government refuses a trade deal with the EU because Brussels demands we remain aligned to EU rules, would you try to block that no deal? I'm not going to hypothecate where things are going to go well, now. This could they, happen. I think, There's a 50 50 the, chance. The actually, well, no, they think the, the actual negotiations begin tomorrow. It is going to be tough, and there, the time frame is, is going to be tight indeed. No, I know all that, but would you try to block leaving with no trade deal? No, I don't believe we're not going to have a trade deal. That's been made sense. In fact, the no deal scenario planning from the MOD and number 10 has actually been dropped. They're not, uh, there's not even a contingency plan now because there's a determination to get a trade deal. Yeah, but if we don't? Then you're left with no deal, and like I said, there and is... would you oppose that? That's my question. It's quite a simple I, I'm question. Say, I'm saying it's not a scenario that's even to be entertained, and therefore there's no requirement to give it and even ask me the question. Hold on, it's a scenario that the government knows could well happen. Uh, no, it couldn't. Not because there will be a form of trade deal. One form. It might be a freer, looser trade deal than might have originally been anticipated. We have seen the prime minister. We've seen David Frost, the uh, who's leading the negotiations for Mr. Johnson. We've seen them make clear there are certain things which, unless the EU backs down, they will not agree to a deal. And, and be... yet you, who were so against no deal 12 months ago, are not now prepared to say you're going to fight to stop no deal this time. I will absolutely. There'll be many of us that will fight. To to stop no deal. The point, though, is that the threat of no deal is not the same as it was before. We came very, very close to actually going over that cliff edge, and thankfully that's been avoided. And I think the nation recognises that as well, given the result of the last general election. Tobias Elwood, thank you very much. Now, talking about those uh, trade negotiations, the EU has published its negotiating mandate, agreed by all 27 members. The British government will publish its mandate tomorrow. Talks will begin next week. Let's go straight to Brussels and our Adam Fleming, who's there. Uh, Adam Fleming, looking at the EU mandate now, it may not be quite as hard line uh, on matters of alignment and so on as we were led to believe. Yeah, I think there's been a bit of exaggerating going on by both sides of the other side's position. And a few observers as well have been throwing around some caricatures of the two sides' positions. And when you look at the EU position, it's not quite as dramatic as lots of people think. Um, the first exhibit is the speech that Michel Barnier, the chief negotiator, he is staying after all, <laughs> uh, gave today to his old business school uh, here in Brussels. He said things like... We understand the UK wants its own rule book. OK, so the UK is not going to be a rule taker. I don't believe the UK will become sort of some sort of Singapore on Thames. OK, some divergence from EU rules might be OK after all. And finally, we're asking that the UK and the EU lay down together a number of rules building on our current high standards in specific areas. OK, maybe the two sides could be sovereign equals. Now, isn't that just what the UK is asking for? Not to be a rule taker, to have the power to diverge and to be treated as a sovereign 
equal. And if you want to read the mandate in real detail that was published this week, it's 46 pages long. There are a few other clues about some areas of flex there as well. Adam, that's fascinating. Thank you for that. Thanks for bringing us up to date there. Adam uh, Fleming in Brussels. Now, Labour Party members have just received their ballot papers in the party's leadership contest. They're also electing a deputy leader to replace Tom Watson, one of the candidates in the deputy contest to the party's only Scottish MP these days, Ian Murray, has just got the backing of two former Labour leaders, Gordon Brown and Tony Blair. He joins me now. Good evening. Good evening, Andrew. So, Tony Blair's backing you for deputy leader. I guess that's the death knell of your campaign. Well, I think it's important to point out what Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, Elizabeth Smith on behalf of John Smith has backed my campaign this week, did back in the 90s. They understood the Labour Party had to change. They went through that whole process and they proved that if the Labour Party changes, it can reconnect with the public. And that's why they're backing my campaign. It's incredibly important to look at the people who've done this before. But that's not the mood of the Labour Party today. You will know that better than me. I mean, let's just look at what uh, Labour Party members think of Tony Blair versus other Labour leaders. I mean, Mr Blair is the biggest winner your party has ever had in its history. And yet there he is in our graph, in this poll. He's in 10th place behind other lead leaders, many of whom were losers. Your biggest loser, Jeremy Corbyn, is the most popular of all. What does that tell you about your party? But this has been my whole message about being standing for deputy leader, and that's the message of change. Change has been put on the ballot paper by ordinary party members up and down the country. And what I'm saying to party yeah. members is that if we think that the general election on the 12th of December was a real success story for the party, if Jeremy Corbyn deserves 10 out of 10, if an 80-seat Conservative majority means that Labour Party members are happy, then they're going to have to vote for someone else in this deputy leadership contest because that would be the continuity that they want. Now, we cannot continue to trash the Labour Party's past and the great successes we had in government because that's the foundation for how we prove to people we can do it again and that's incredibly important. I understand people what have you're to saying. That. I understand the argument but it just seems you are really out of kilter with the mood of your party which is probably why in tonight's uh, poll of deputy leader you come last uh, with nine percent of the vote. I mean you even I think is it nine or ten points behind Richard Bergen. But what we're trying to do in this deputy leadership campaign, my whole to message and you're is it. to be in tune with the public because it's the voters and the public that are most important now in this whole process. It's not the public who's got to vote, Mr Murray, it's the Labour Party and they don't agree with you. Yes, but Andrew, what you're missing in this whole process is the narrative that ha about change, that somebody had to come into this process and be honest about the future. If anybody wants to vote for continuity, there's four other deputy leadership candidates sure. that they can vote for. And we have to listen to the public. Now, this isn't me saying this. This is me being a filter for all those doors that everybody knocked on in the run-up to the 12th of December, who said if the Labour Party doesn't change the leadership, doesn't change direction on policy, Right. and doesn't change the culture of our party, they won't turn back to vote for us again. And that's been my whole message throughout this whole campaign. So when Rebecca Long-Bailey uh, says that there's not... She's running for the leadership, of course, that there's not one single policy from the 2019 Labour manifesto that should be dropped, she's wrong. Well, the public have said they didn't want the manifesto. Look, let's just go to this no, we narrative. Know what the election result was. I'm asking you, but is exactly, she wrong? But of course she's wrong, because we have to listen to what the public have told us. And if anybody... Many people have said to me over the course of this context, which I think is extraordinary, that the Labour Party manifesto in 2019 was superbly popular. And it was so superbly popular that the public decided to vote Tory. So we have to reflect on that and we have to be honest but, about that. And if we're not honest about that, how can we possibly change right. the party and he, move forward? He, here is the uh, 10 policy points from Keir Starmer. He's running for leader too. And uh, every one of them pretty much fits in with what Jeremy Corbyn stood for. Every one of them. Well, so look, he hasn't got the message either, has but he? Let's look at the in policies in the manifesto that are popular out there and are the right things. The narrative about the economy not working for the vast majority of the public, I think everyone would agree with. The Green New Deal stuff was excellent in terms of what it was doing to transform our parliament so, so we can get policies for climate change. And the whole renationalisation agenda, I think people are fed up being ripped off. And therefore, I'd like to broaden the debate about not-for-profits, cooperatives, social enterprises, employee ownership, those kinds of big issues. But what we need to do is so talk about the future. 
future. The Corbyn agenda. We need to talk about the future. We need to talk about the future of work. We need to talk about automation, artificial intelligence, climate change, um, the, Excuse the me, crisis the in social care. Excuse me, there's a lot about climate change and uh, talking about the future is not a policy. But it's just, the, it's the, just a, it's kind of meaningless. People well, always talk about the, the proposition. Future. Where would you change from the 2019 manifesto? The proposition that you're putting forward at the moment is that we should go into the 2024 election with a similar manifesto and no change of direction. Not at all. Now, my Mr. proposition, Murray, you said my Rebecca, proposition, no, no, hold on. my proposition Rebecca is we need to Long change. Bailey, you said she was wrong to say that there wasn't one single policy that she would drop. So I'm asking you, well, what would you drop if she's wrong? Well, I would drop the issues around whether or not we spend all our money on renationalisation when we should be putting it into early years. I'd drop some of the policies that people thought were just giveaways. I knocked on a door during the general election to a Labour voter who's voted Labour all their life and they said, what freebie are you giving me today? We didn't have the credibility to deliver that manifesto and that's what the public told us on the doorsteps up and down the country and people know that to be the case. When I was in Scunthorpe with Dick Dakin, who lost his seat, who lost six seats in Lincolnshire, I met a gentleman who said, I didn't vote Labour for the first time I voted con Conservative and I did that because Labour's manifesto wasn't offering me a shake of the stick that I deserved and was looking after my family. Right. We need to reflect on that. I understand. And the individual policies yeah. we can pick apart or not, but it's the overall direction and narrative of the party that's important. The, you are a Scottish MP. You're the only Labour Scottish MP. If you become deputy leader or if you're in the next shadow cabinet, whoever is the leader, if a future minority Labour government did a deal with the SNP to stay in power, could you stay in office? Well, these are dreadful hypothetical arguments, aren't they? Because that's not going to be the case. In 2024, we need a credible alternative government that can go into that election looking to be a minority here. But can I just tell you the, the scale of the you challenge? Probably, your party could probably hope to do is to become the largest party at the next election, given how far back you're coming. You've only got about 200 MPs at the moment. So if they were to do a deal with the SNP to get into power, could you credibly stay in office? Well, let me give you the scale of the challenge, because you're right to point no, out... I know out. the scale of the challenge. The scale what of the I'm challenge is, is... If the challenge requires the SNP support, could you stay in office with that? I don't think that will be something that will come to pass. And let me tell well, you, you why. Hope it won't. The scale of the challenge is huge. And this is something I've been saying all over the country. And this is a, an issue not just for Scotland, no. but the whole of the UK. Because we need to return more Scottish Labour MPs. It's simple and straightforward that, as that. You are trying and, well, to avoid but what I'm, no, I'm trying to answer, well, I'm going trying, to answer no, the you're question. You're trying to avoid the question. Well, I was, the next sentence it's, was answering your question. OK, well, let's Because hear not it. only do the SNP take seats of us in Scotland, of course, which deprive of us more red seats, but they also damage us in England. Because the narrative of doing a deal with the nationalists damages us fundamentally in England. That's what so, happened in 2015. Right, so and that's what happened in 2017 so, and 2019. But you still these haven't answered the question. These hypothetical arguments do Could not get us onto the substantive issues. Could you be part of a Labour government that had done a deal to get into power with the SNP. But they don't mathematically don't need to do a deal. If there's a minority Labour government, this is a key, this is a key thing we've been arguing about since six weeks before the 12th of December. A minority Labour government would put forward a Queen's speech and a budget. Right. And if the SNP decided they didn't want to support that, they would bring back a Tory right. government. I, I, they are so not going not to going, do that. You're not answering my The mathematics gonna, just simply don't work. So, uh, Keir Starmer says that if the SNP wins a clear majority in the Scottish parliamentary elections next year, and they do so on a second referendum ticket, they explicitly want a second independence referendum, should, he thinks Labour should concede that second referendum do you? Well, it's a really interesting dynamic here, isn't it? Because we lost to the Conservatives by 80 seats back on the 12th of December. And we didn't all sit there on the 13th of December and say we're now going to concede sure. all of our policies that we've put forward and just support everything the Conservative uh, government's well, going I, to do. I, I'm simply we're asking, principally we, we have 30 them. seconds. I'm simply asking you, is Keir Starmer right or wrong to say that in these circumstances, he'd concede a second referendum. I think it's wrong at this stage to use hypotheticals in 2021 when we should be well, talking about this substantive issue. Andrew, you're the most eminent broadcaster in this country on Scottish That's issues. You understand them. Anywhere. Flattening gets you everywhere. Gonna, you understand you know, you the issues can, in Scotland. You can sideline as much you, as you want. You understand the we issues in Scotland. We know when you're not answering the question. Douglas but, Murray, we've also run out of time, but I thank you for Douglas being Murray's a conservative. Uh, with us to, to <laughs> Ian, Ian Murray, sorry. Uh, thank you for that. Now, next Wednesday, I'll be interviewing two of the candidates in the leadership race, Rebecca Long-Bailey and Keir Starmer. You heard me talking about them there. It's an extended Andrew Neil show from 7 to 8.
here on BBC Two. Put it in your diary. And just in case you worry, I wonder, I've already done an extended interview with the other remaining leadership candidate, Lisa Nandy. That's it for tonight. I'll be back here with Politics Live at 12.15 on BBC tomorrow. Until then, bye-bye.